delighted to be here in Mombasa with you all and thank you very much um, Daniela and colleagues for inviting me to come. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about needs-based education and a little bit about the SPHERE project. Does this work? What's what you do? Okay. So we have major shifts in our societies, um, moving towards very much a culture of health, well-being, but along with that we have increasing inequalities in health. We have the very rich, we have the very poor, very different health outcomes. We also have people living longer with more and more diseases, taking more and more medicines. We're increasingly using IT, and of course alongside that, as you will know, you pharmacists, we have the whole genetic revolution going on. So future health services are going to have to be very different. As we move to universal health care as well, I think that will make it even more different. But we will have increased consumerism. As health professionals, we'll have to spend more time reviewing evidence. We will have to show the value of the services, the value of the medicines we're providing. We will have longer consultations with greater information exchange. We'll be increasingly using um, communication and IT. Genomics will be part of our practice and AI will be part of our practice. That is coming very rapidly. And I commend to you something called the TOEFL Review, which came out um, recently in the UK. It's a really good read. It's a really easy read, actually. It's really nicely presented. And it's about AI and genomics and the future challenges to our education. This is a slide from FIP, which was presented at the World Health Assembly last week. And I think it's a really nice slide. It, it, it shows that though we've made great strides in our health outcomes over the past 40 years, we're still facing many, many challenges. So there's legal and fiscal and cultural challenges, costs. Our students can be very varied in how they come out. Our advanced practice qualifications and so on vary across the country. Patients' needs are changing. Pharmaceutical science is providing a lot of new opportunities. But still, we have about 6 million children each year dying under five from preventable diseases. And we have some poorly controlled health issues in all our countries. So, this is based on an, an editorial that Tina Brock from Monash University and myself wrote. Um, a few years ago now, but I really like it, and it was based on an exhibition in the British Museum where they had stitched tablets and capsules, 14,000 individual tablets and capsules onto a massive, massive cloth to illustrate that our planet has a population of over 7 billion, and each of them exposed to about 14,000 prescription medicines across their lifetime. So if all those people are taking all those medicines, how many pharmacists do we need? How many experts on medicines do we need? And for what role should they be prepared? And are our current educational models actually achieving those goals? It's a tremendous opportunity for us as pharmacists. Oops, oh, can you, did that, that didn't work. What's happening? Yeah, can you leave it just like that first? Um, so we have, um, if we think about what the patient thinks, we need to think about the occupational, the emotional, and the social effects of taking the medicine, not just the pharmacological and pharmaceutical effects. We need to think about the patient as a person and how they have the responsibility for taking those medicines, and we need to build an alliance with them. And we need to, to do that, we need much more of a focus on the health professional as a person. So we need technical excellence, yes, of course. We need all our pharmaceutical skills that set us apart as a pharmacist from other health professionals. But we need good interpersonal skills. And if we have those, we have increased patient satisfaction. <coughs> I've already mentioned polypharmacy, the massive problem. <coughs> the 75-year-old woman prescribed all those medicines. What we can do about it, how we can rationalize it, how we can begin to de-prescribe very big movement in the UK, Canada, <coughs> Australia for de-prescribing now going on. 
and the massive challenge. I don't need to say that when I'm speaking in Africa. And um, my colleague Winnie's going to talk about it later from the Congo Pharmacy Association, but the massive challenge of AMR. So, then I, I'd like to go back to this, to the Lancet Commission, which was published nearly 10 years ago now, but I still think it's very, very important. And they said that all health professionals in all countries should be educated to mobilize knowledge and to, to engage in critical reasoning and ethical conduct so they're competent to participate in patient and population-centered health systems as members of locally responsive and globally connected teams. They also said that our curricula are outdated, fragmented, and content-orientated. We don't prepare our students well enough for teamwork and collaboration. And the future of healthcare is very much going to be about teams, be they primary healthcare teams, be they in hospitals or whatever. We have to work in teams. When students are being trained, they have episodic encounters with patient illnesses rather than seeing continued continuity in holistic healthcare. And our training has been hospital-orientated at the expense of primary care. And I really believe that with universal health care, we need to see a shift to much more of our training being done in primary health care, where people are, where people live. People will go to hospital for less and less time. In my country, people go in, they come out. They're not there. We can't train our students. They won't see the diseases unless they're seeing them in primary care or in people's homes. And there's an imbalance between health workforces and health needs. And I think there's going to be much more of a shift to competency-based healthcare. People will be doing roles that other healthcare professionals have done in the past. An example of that, in the UK now, pharmacists are prescribing a lot. That was something done by doctors, but pharmacists are the experts on medicines. We should be the ones for prescribing. That's just one example. And there needs to be a greater alignment between our education institutions and our systems that are responsible for delivering the health care. We need to work very closely with them. We need to be socially accountable. And our health professionals need to be competent in providing the highest quality care. We need to have global excellence, but it needs to be locally relevant. And we need to have vibrant education institutions with a good physical infrastructure, with good equipment, and so on, and outstanding academics who are motivated and have a good career structure, which makes it worth being an academic. So, um, Ralph already alluded to um, our needs-based model that we developed some time ago in FIP education. But basically, our vision was that our education needs to be based on local needs. So what are the needs here in Kenya? What are the healthcare needs? Where are the people? What are their needs? Therefore, what should our education be focused on? What are our pharmaceutical needs? In Kenya, you have pharmaceutical industry, so of course we need to train pharmacists for that. But we also have primary healthcare. We also have hospitals. We need to train pharmacists to be in every area. So what services do we need to train our pharmacists to provide? And what competencies and what education do they need to do that? Sorry, that slide's a bit dark, I don't know why. So we need pharmacists with the right skills, in the right numbers. Do you have enough pharmacists here in Kenya? I don't know. Um, maybe you need more, you need to train more. With the right values and behaviours, in the right place. And that will depend on demographics, disease prevalence, innovation, and patient expectations. And of course, it needs to be quality assured. So, that's a very quick run through, because I don't have much time. My last few minutes, I will tell you a little bit about the project that we're doing here in Kenya, the, the Kenya Nottingham Partnership in Kenyan University Transform transformation of pharmacy and chemistry degree provision. Of course, I'm focusing on pharmacy here. We have another whole sector of the project focusing on chemistry. Um, the SPEAR partnership, SPEAR stands for Strategic Partnerships in Higher Education, Innovation and Reform. 
and it's funded by UK Aid. And it's, there are nine different projects, um, I think six of them in East Africa, all in different areas. Ours is the only pharmacy one. So we're very privileged to have got this because they had 276 applicants and they only awarded nine. So it's a real honour that UK Aid thought our project was worthy. And we, we're, we're working um, we're working with a number of partners. That's us meeting in Naivasha in April, some of us anyway, some of you are on there. And we're working, we're delighted to be working with PSK on this project, so thank you for that, Daniela. But we're also working with FIP, at GSK, and the Kenyan Association of Manufacturers. But we're, um, our major, major partners are these five universities, Nairobi, Masai Mara, Maseno, Kenyatta, and Jomo Kenyatta, in a particular order. And we're working with our colleagues in those five universities. Um, three of the universities have very strong existing pharmacy courses, and in Maseno we're working with them to, to begin a pharmacy course, and Masai Mara are even further back, but just beginning to think about developing a pharmacy course. So we're working with all those partners. Next slide, please. So our aims are to create a globally competitive and adaptive chemistry and pharmacy workforce to meet the requirements of the rapidly industrializing um, Kenyan economy, to enhance the collaboration between industry and healthcare in Kenya, um, and to link learning outcomes and wider impacts at the individual, institutional, systematic, systemic and national levels and to develop diagnostic and benchmarking tools. So how are we going to achieve this? We're working with our colleagues to develop a needs-based curricula in Kenya which will address shortages and specific skills in pharmacy and chemistry. We're working with providers, that's all you have there, <laughs> to provide placements for our students, which will increase the skills and employability of our graduates, give them the right skills for the workforce. And we're working to increase the capability of academic staff, and also looking at um, better outcomes for women, younger academics, and people from underserved, underserved communities. Next slide, please. So how are we going to do it? We have three major outputs. One is, the development of the new courses. One is the introduction of, of, of modules inspired by a module, we, a, a major final year capstone module we do at the University of Nottingham, which I'll tell you a little bit about in my other talk. But basically, it's um, giving pharmacists skills in leadership and management via them running a simulated community pharmacy, where we use simulated patients and they work in groups of six to do that, um, giving them the skills for pharmacy practice. Introduction of industrial and healthcare linked sponsored modules. We're developing placement code of conduct. We're improving uh, placement logbooks and in, and in helping um, to improve laboratory practicals as well. Um, output two is about introducing new teaching methods, such as what I've just said, more group work, different different ways of teaching, and implementing student feedback, looking at different ways of assessment, moving away from perhaps the three-hour written exam that's totally based on knowledge to more skill-based exams like objective structured clinical exams where patients actually have a where patients where um, where students actually see patients um, in a in a structured way in an examination and have to react rather than writing it down. So they're assessing communication as well as their actual um, knowledge. Mentoring programs, and we're, we're doing some work on gender equity as well. And we're having a one day workshop on gender equity in, in Nadasha um, in three weeks' time. Next slide, please. So, gender equity, an interesting issue, just as an aside, this is from the Pharmaceutical Journal the other, um, a few weeks ago. But as you can see, um, women are very underrepresented still in Africa. I don't I think in Kenya it's better, from what I can see out there. <laughs> so, unless more women come to conferences, I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, that's just an interesting slide to show you where 
Uh, we have far more women in pharmacy than um, in, in, our, in Europe. Next slide, please. So our third output is doing things like this, actually disseminating what we're doing. And this is a good way of meeting that output today, um, involving industry and the broader society, helping to track alumni, developing toolkits that other countries will be able to use to develop their pharmacy curriculum, their pharmacy workforce, based on um, what we're doing in this project um, as well. So that's a very quick run through, I know. If anybody wants to know any more, do grab me, um, or Ralph, or Nilhan, or my colleague Alison, who's also from Nottingham working on the project, who you um, who's sitting over there. But um, it's, it's great to be here, great to be able to tell you about our project. I'm excited about it, as you can tell. Excited that we can work with you here in Kenya to help develop food profession. I'm very delighted to see one of my ex-students sitting there, who's actually um, working now back in Nairobi. So that's really nice as well to have that thing. So um, thank you very much, everybody. And I'll see you around. <laughs>